Welcome. It is Sunday, January 15th, 2023, and I'm Robin from Western Massachusetts, and this is the Morgellons Call of the Week. And today our topic is going to be how to identify parasites. So I'm so glad to be part of this community and to work with Richard Kuhns, the author of how to get your life back from Morgellons and other skin parasites. I remember when I first found Richard's book and I found this call and um, I was talking to Margie who was on the call with uh, 10 Principles of Resiliency. I called her and and she, I was shocked that she actually talked to Richard. I, it's like he was some you know, big celebrity to me and I couldn't believe that he was so accessible. But he is accessible. He's here every Sunday. You can email him. You can ask him questions. He has suffered and conquered and brings hope and solutions on a regular basis. And uh, I think he's one of the leading experts in the world, if not the leading expert on Morgellons, because he's experienced it. It's not just head knowledge. It's it's real experiential truth. So at this point in time, I'd like to introduce and welcome Richard Kuhns, the author of How to Get Your Life Back from Morgellons and Other Skin Parasites. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for all those kind words. It's a pleasure to be here. And yes, one of my goals is to be accessible. <laughs> I remember a couple of years ago when I was writing one of my uh, revisions to the book, I had attempted to contact Randy Wymore at uh, Oklahoma State University, who has done a lot of work in Morgellons over the years and research. And he was totally inaccessible. Can't imagine how frustrating that can be. So I can imagine how frustrating it is to both suffer from this damn disease and then not be able to reach anybody, not be able to communicate with anybody, not be able to get any answers. I mean, they don't even have a damn book to look at. Well, let me take that back. Dr. Saverly does have a book uh, called Morgellons, The Legitimization of Disease. She published it about... I guess four years ago. Well, let me first of all, because we will get technical in this discussion, so let me do the FDA and AMA disclaimers. Number one, before you start the King Diet, which we now have renamed the Morgellons Diet, because in the internet, the King Diet doesn't ring any bells yet, but Morgellons does. So people search for Morgellons, they don't search for the king. It's still the best, the top diet out there. And the only one that, to my knowledge, will support you fully in getting your life back. Now, before you start this amazing diet, I'm here to instruct you that according to the FDA, you are literally, but it's up to you, uh, you should contact your doctor and Inform him that you're going to start the diet. And before you accept any of my recommendations, you are to discuss them with your doctor to make sure they do not interfere with any health problems you're presently experiencing. So that's the purpose of talking with your doctor to make sure the diet and any of our recommendations don't interfere with any health problems you're presently experiencing. Now, None of us, Rob and me, Ethel, uh, Mary. Mary, none of us are trained physicians. We have not passed any boards or, and we've not been in the hospital. So we are not licensed to diagnose, treat, cure, or mitigate any disease. Only licensed physicians are allowed to do that. However, we can educate you. We can I can educate you, we can educate you how to utilize the Morgellons diet to your benefit. We can educate you how to clean your skin. By the time most people find me, 
they suffered for usually years, sometimes as many as 20 years, and have layers and layers like an onion of, of skin that's been destroyed that has to be removed. Uh, so we want to clean the skin, get all that stuff out of your skin, and how to clean your environment. Contra contrary to what some experts would have you believe, you are contagious. You are a walking, talking, breeding machine. Everywhere you go, these organisms can shed from your body and be deposited in your environment. Your furniture, your automobile, your home, your workspace. If you go to a friend's house and spend more than a few minutes there, they're going to be deposited to there as well. So that means even once you get them out of your body and get them off of your skin, whenever you go back into those places, you're going to be recontaminated because these organisms, wherever you have shed them, have the capability of coming back onto you. So, <clears throat> we can educate you how to use the diet, clean them out of your skin, clean them out of your environment, and how to build health and immune functioning through targeted supplements. Now, I say targeted supplements because I just don't go throwing any old supplement at you. In fact, all of our supplements are compatible with the Morgellons diet, a.k.a. King diet. And to, to think that you have had these organisms for several months, if not years, that it hasn't really affected your body, your immune functioning, your health, well, that, that's a dream. So if at all possible, you want to build your health and immune functioning. Now, every supplement has a purpose, and when you read about them, there are only a few that are not compatible with the first stage of the Margallon's diet. So you need to read uh, the description in, in the store to make sure uh, that the supplements, and as I say, there are only a couple that are not compatible with stage one of the King diet. So what the heck and how do you determine what's going on? By now, you've gone to multiple numbers of doctors, specialists, dermatologists, maybe even a psychiatrist or two if you listen to your, med to your physician. Robin, how many doctors do you think you went to altogether uh, when you first started? What, what were your initial symptoms, and how many doctors did you go to? Uh, well, the first doctor I went to was my dermatologist. I had lesions, and I had bites all over me, and um, he told me, you know, it was a psychosomatic illness, and he was going to give me antipsychotic drugs, which probably would have helped because they lower the dopamine intake, but I refused to take them. Okay. Uh, and that was the last time. And I probably added a year to my recovery. <laughs> but but um, so I saw him. I saw another dermatologist who actually did a DNA skin scraping and said, yes, you have mites, but I can't identify what kind and I don't know how to treat them. I went to uh, I went to two specialists. I went to my primary care physician, and then my family wanted me to go to a psychologist, psychiatrist, neurologist, um, entomologist. Three, I went to three entomologists, like sending them samples, and uh, nobody helped. Nobody What's helped. an entomologist? A bug specialist. Bug man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can send samples to uh, universities, and they have entomology departments. And there's my, I don't know where my mom found this entomologist in eastern Massachusetts that um, identifies 
insects and stuff and and uh, she's the one that recommended I go see a neurologist because I was something was wrong with me. Um, you, you weren't know, thinking correctly. Right, and I did find an entomologist online that, but I I had a terrible camera. I took some pictures, and they told me what they thought it was, but they didn't give me any solutions. I called, I don't know, five maybe ten exterminators. Nobody would come, and um, and the one that did came brought the springtails. <laughs> I, I wish I could laugh about it. Um, <laughs> so that's a long answer to a short question. Yeah, Mary, how many doctors did you go to? Um, I only went to two because lucky you. Well, I have other disorders, and my whole life I'm used to being told that what was happening to me wasn't happening to me because I wasn't diagnosed till I was 50. So when when I, I first went to my primary care and I told her I thought I had scabies and I was scared that I was contagious, and, and she all but laughed me out of her office and said there's that I didn't have to worry about anybody getting scabies and that she would give me the um, the lotion to put on, but she didn't think that um, that I had it. So contagious. Yeah, and I, and I was so afraid for the nurses in there, and and they were all, I guess they were all just convinced. This is before I knew that this was considered a psychological disorder. Um, so, so then I went, so I thought I'd try again, and I went to a dermatologist, and he was absolutely horrible. And I didn't have any marks on my skin at that point, and he told me I was textbook delusional. Mm-hmm. And and that pretty much ended me going to doctors, because I don't trust them to begin with. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, we're not here to bash them, but uh, when it comes to skin parasites... They're just not trained, most of them. I had a skin lesion that went all the way across my stomach and was one and a half inches wide, and it was like an open wound. And the dermatologist wow. said, you did that to yourself. <laughs> wow. Well, on I had at the time lived with a significant other that was uh, a nurse in a local hospital in, in the uh, critical care. And I depended on her to know who the reputable physicians were because if you want to find a, a good doctor, you you, uh, you ask the nurses. They, they know who the doctors are. And she contracted the organisms from me, so I thought, well, what the heck, uh, bet, no better envoy than send her. So she went to the doctor and you know, it was the uh, typical uh, lotion, the quell or whatever uh, that they prescribed, Lindane, I forget which it was that, that he prescribed. And, of course, that everything, it, it helped for a few days, and then we were back in hell again. And uh, then I started reaching out to doctors, and I went to my regular physician, and he couldn't find, nobody, he didn't diagnose me as delusional, but he didn't think, he didn't know, you know, uh, I only went to about maybe two or three, and then I eventually reached out to a uh, a specialist, a dermatologist. It took me three months to get an appointment. I mean, I, I in the meantime, what do you do? You you suffer and and, you, and you're driven crazy 24/7, and you're you know you only wish these guys could uh, just spend. Ten hour or, or or an hour in your shoes. They wouldn't make you wait three months. And I went and I made a classic mistake. I took along samples and asked him to look under a microscope to see what they were. And <clears throat> of course he came back and said, nah, there's nothing there." And he introduced me to the uh, diagnosis of folia uh, uh That means uh, folia dur and folia that there are two, two or three, that uh, two people can claim, claim they have the same problems, and it, it's all uh, psychosomatic, psychological, it's a phobia kind of thing. 
And <clears throat> believe me, my specialization in, the, in my stress management facility was I specialized in phobias. And I never heard of anybody having who came to me to deal with phobias, like whether it be closed spaces or fear of flying an airline or whatever, sharing the same phobia with somebody that they lived with. I'd never heard of that. So uh, anyway, he did the plug sample and the blood test and everything, and it came back negative, and the only thing was elevated uh, CBC levels, and that's essentially uh, it. So uh, there have been people on the program that have shared they've been to as many as 40, F-O, 40, 40 doctors. Uh, and gotten nowhere. There have been people that have shared they've driven as long as far as three or four hours for an appointment uh, to stand in front of this expert and be ridiculed in front of his clean training class. Uh, oh, here's a classic case of people uh, of somebody suffering from delusions and and uh, telling his training physicians that hey, uh, this this is what it is. Well. The bottom line is we all know if you're on this program, you all know that's a bunch of crap and that we do suffer from something. And Dr. Saverly, fortunately, is, I guess, the first person with a uh, medical uh, degree of some sort to actually write about it in her book called Morgellons, The Legitimization of a Disease. Anyway, going back into the uh, early uh part of the century, I devised a questionnaire that has evolved over time to help me figure out and help people figure out what they are actually dealing with. And so I'm going to go to this questionnaire. It was attached to the last email that went out uh, 20 minutes before the program started. So if you have access to it, you can open it up and go through this questionnaire. And this questionnaire allows me to take a look at what's going on with each person and then make detailed recommendations. Again, we're not doctors. I'm not a doctor. And before you accept any of my recommendations, you are to discuss them thoroughly with your medical doctor to make sure they do not interfere with any health problems. First of all, I ask for your full name, that first and last name. And the only reason is I store these in my computer. They are not shared with anybody else. Nobody else has access to this information. This is confidential. But uh, a year or two from now, you might write me and uh, ask me questions or whatever. What it does, it allows me to go into my database, pull you up, because you never, when you email me, you don't give me enough information. <laughs> you give me, hey, I woke up and I got these things all over my bed, uh, these black specks, you know, what's going on? Well, <laughs> that tells me nothing. So I look up your questionnaire and I, I can get a better feel for what's going on or where you've been and what, what's been happening. So I always appreciate your full name, today's date, and your age. Now, at some point, this information may be used for uh, data collection. Uh, not your name, but your age and your, uh, uh, whether you're male or female, that kind of thing, and what area of the country you are in. So the second question is your address. I don't really need your street address, like uh, your number. You know, basically, I uh, live in uh, uh, Quebec, you know, or, or whatever, and your email address. That's important because I use that email address to send you my detailed recommendations. Now we get into what's going on. Number one, I ask you if you have non-healing lesions or sores, and you either do your or you don't. Uh, and that really doesn't, it just tells me a little bit about what's going on. Then I ask you if you have non-healing facial lesions. Well, there are about maybe 10 or 15% of people who are dealing with uh, skin parasites who have non-healing facial lesions. And that rings a little bell and gives me a recommendation to include when I uh, uh, give you your detailed recommendations. Next question is important. Uh, abnormal fibers or filaments growing from your skin at various non-healing sites where skin parasites reside. You can see them with the use of a 60 power loop. 
Well, if you read the book, now I'm here to educate you, so how can we utilize this, this, this information? I'm not going to diagnose you, but if you read Dr. Savile's book, Morgellons, The Legitimization of, disease, of a Disease, she wrote so the medical uh, establishment could read it and get familiar with Morgellons and stop poo-pooing it. But in it, she describes, and the one and only thing that determines you have Morgellons is exactly this. Abnormal fil filaments and fibers. Uh, she makes appointment, uh, a, uh, a point of calling them filaments versus fibers because many doctors have looked at these filaments and said, oh, that's just from your clothing. That's fibers from your clothing. No, these are filaments growing from your skin. Now, they can be various colors, uh, they can be various sizes, and actually as small as uh, almost you can't see them with your eyes. You have to see with a 60-power loop. Well, most of us don't have a 60-power loop on, our, on, on hand, so uh, that part of the question uh, you're probably not going to answer, but you're going to tell me that you have filaments and fibers. And then all I'm, I'm going to do in my recommendations is I'm going to point out that according to this uh, resource doctor, uh, by Dr. Saverly is that she identifies this as a characteristic uh, of Morgellons. Then the next question is, uh, are there, do you find cotton or lint-like substance in your bedding and clothing without any reasonable explanation? I mean, okay, you can wear these sweaters, these woolly sweaters, and, and find uh, uh, fibers and filaments, and that would be a reasonable explanation. But most people are not wearing uh, this cashmere or type of uh, uh, fiber, uh, fibrous uh, clothing. So without any reasonable explanation, people will, yes, I see the cotton-like or lint-like substance. Okay, now remember that the, uh, some of these filaments and fibers can be six, you need a 60 power uh, scope to see them. But that doesn't mean they stay on your skin. All these filaments and fibers do shed. So these tiny little filaments and fibers do shed, and it's my speculation that they accumulate to form uh, a cotton or lint-like substance in your bedding and clothing. And I would extrapolate that to mean that these are filaments coming from your skin, according to Dr. Dr. Saverly. This is Morgellons. Now, next question is, grayish spider-like veins just under the skin. All right, maybe 10 or 15% of the people do have that. That's just an informational question. That's something that we can use later on uh, for research purposes. Intense itching of the skin. Well, this one's important. If you don't click here that you have intense itching of the skin uh, and you haven't, you don't have the filaments and fibers, well, you're probably not dealing with any skin parasites, to my knowledge anyway. So that's an important question. But again, if you've already told me that you're dealing with uh, filaments and fibers, we are still looking at more gallons. Stinging and biting, all right, that's just another typical symptom that people feel. They, they feel a stinging, they feel a biting that feels like it almost goes to the, the core of their bone. Now, burning sensations of the skin. All right, now we're looking at something else. This is a usually a redness, a burning sensation of the skin. Again, I'm not here to diagnose you, but if you... Go to uh, Wikipedia, you go to WebMD, you go to uh, any of these resources and you type in symptoms of burning of the skin. It's going to come back as skin fungus. Oftentimes things like uh, uh, crotch itch or uh, athlete's foot or something like that. And if you look up images on the Internet of skin fungus, it gets scary as hell. I mean, uh, they can get pretty damn ugly. So... This, in my mind, says, all right, we are dealing with most likely skin fungus. Now, hair loss, this is typical. And, again, this is there for uh, information and gives me an idea of where you were as well. But uh, one day, if we ever get around to uh, uh, doing some real research, we can look into this and we'll know that, oh, yes, 7% uh, of the people who are dealing with Morgellons do have hair loss 
versus if they're only dealing with columbo, they, they don't. What? So chronic fatigue, that shows up in many, many, uh, and it is often there. It's, it's very unlikely. So more than likely when we compile this research, we're going to find that probably 90%, at least 90% have chronic fatigue. And, of course, this also can be related to when the symptoms first happen because if you filled out this questionnaire after having experienced the symptoms for the first time only a couple of weeks ago, there may not be any chronic fatigue versus if it was about uh, 10 years ago or three years ago when the, the symptoms first happened. Brain fog, well, that's another one. Uh, now, when I look at these also, I notice that uh, it's typical that people with Morgellons and skin parasites have both chronic fatigue and brain fog. They kind of run together. And also, after they've been on my protocol, these kind of things kind of clear up. So, uh, but I don't have to do anything specific about brain fog or chronic fatigue, but they're going to highly likely they're going to cl uh, clear up. Hard nodules under the skin. Well, this also shows up in a high percentage, maybe 30, 40 percent. I'm just guessing because I haven't actually going or analyzed all these questionnaires, but I say, and typically hard nodules under the skin is associated with what doctors might diagnose as pergeonodularis. And again, it's, you go to the, you know, I'm not diagnosing you. You go look at a hard nodules under the skin, WebMD or whatever, and you'll see it's typically uh, pergeal nodularis would be uh, what a hard nod. And they don't know what it is, whether it's bacterial or whether it's viral or whatever. But there is a medication that uh, one of the medications uh, that advertise frequently on TV that uh, does uh, work effectively with it. I, at the moment, don't remember what it is, but I think I sent out an update uh, last week or so, or there will be one going out with that information in it. Fibromyalgia, joint swelling and pain. Well, yes, I'd say at least 50% of people have this. Again, this is a data information for me. So, so far, we know enough to realize that you might be dealing with more gallons and dealing with skin fungus. All right, now we're getting here. Black specks on the skin and bed sheets. Well, in fact, I just got a question. Uh, somebody emailed me a few minutes ago uh, saying, hey, you know, I don't have, you know, when I get out of my bed, I find these specks in the bed. What the heck is it? It's not me. It, how, how are they getting in my bed? Well, most likely it is you. Most likely they are in your skin and, uh, you know, you're breeding them and you're, and you're depositing things from your skin onto the bed sheets that uh, turn into uh, uh, black specks. Okay. Now, black specks does not necessarily mean you are dealing with more gal, I mean, skin mites. Most likely, but not necessarily. Now, this is the only one situation where it is advisable and helpful to have some kind of microscopy, whether it's 60 power, which is very uh, minor. But other than that, I don't recommend people taking pictures and, and sending them to me or to, or to their doctor or whatever. And if you want to take pictures, fine, keep it then. Uh, but it, they're, they're of very little value. The only value having a microscope with these specks is for you to look at them a little more closely and see if the speck is solid or if it is tightly wound filaments. Tightly wound filaments would indicate more gallons. A solid means it could be a red or black or whatever. It could mean it's some kind of mite living in your skin. Okay, so for the most part, I assume it's mites because you don't have the ability to look at it, but it doesn't really matter because uh, in the protocol, we're going to deal with mites as well uh, and also uh, deal with strengthening uh, and, and deal with the Morgellons. Now, P+. plus. 
uh, I'm down to that part of the questionnaire. Do you have lots of activity around your eyelashes and your eyelids, a crusty feeling? Okay, now we're looking for something else. We're looking for springtails. We're looking for columbula. And this is typically how columbula might show up. <clears throat> now, do you feel, oh, I missed a question. Okay, before that, P. Oh, I, I skipped. P is, do you ever feel something is jumping on your ankles or legs but is invisible? Okay, I know many, many years, I don't know, 25 years ago where I, I li I've lived in this home for a long, long time, there was an infestation of fleas in my yard, and they would jump onto my ankles, and I'd carry them into the house, and uh, you could feel them jump, and you looked there, and they were black specks. So you knew, I knew, or figured out, it was fleas I was dealing with and eradicated that and got rid of them. And that was, you know, maybe a decade before I ever had was dealing with uh, uh, columbula or any of the skin parasites. So this is the same kind of feeling, but you can't see it. And this is typically columbula. Columbula springtails or organisms that are about 300, 250 to 300 microns in length. They are the size of a dust particle. Invisible to most people. When you look at them on your skin, I do remember one occasion where I, for some reason or other, was lying in bed and I just looked at my four fingertip. And I saw this little thing sticking up from my forefinger moving, kind of uh, waving, you know, in the middle. I had no idea what it was at the time. That was, uh, you know, like six years before I even knew the word columbula or what a springtail was. But I remembered. I was not able to capture it or do anything with it, but I remember it very distinctly. So this is what columbula is, springtails. They're rod-shaped. They have a uh, middle that bends, and they generally are around floor areas, around uh, moist areas, anywhere there is uh, uh, moisture like uh, leaky pipes, basements, uh, uh, moldy areas. Uh, they can be in, in the ground, on the flowers, uh, that, or the uh, plants that you have inside. So this is where they typically reside. And they can spring up as high as about 12, 13 inches. I've published a few updates that describe them as wingless acrobatics. It used to be thought that they just haphazardly hopped. But they actually can uh, direct their, their flight and land exactly where they want and whenever they want. So they are pretty darn sophisticated for a little bug to not have wings to be able to land and maneuver the air currents and get where they want to go. So they land on you, they crawl, they bite, they itch like hell. And that's typical. Now, not everybody is infected the same way with springtails. Uh, sometimes people are infected not from a ground source, but maybe by lying on somebody's infected uh, couch and you never really have them around your ankles or your legs but they then take over the upper body and you may find the crusty eyelids which is also an indication of springtails okay so so far we've looked at four things skin uh, uh, morgellons skin fungus mites and columbula and that's pretty much the area of uh, my expertise and the things that we deal with, except for one more. Okay, so we go on to R, and you feel something crawling around your skin, but it's invisible. Okay, that could be uh, uh, either Morgellons or it could be Columbula or it might even be mites. Now, there are seven questions coming up here which are very important. And these have to do with strongyloides sericalis. 
Again, I'm not diagnosing you. Any of you can go to the Internet and search for symptoms of strongyloides sericalis. And these seven will show up. Do you have itchy rashes on your feet, buttocks, and waist? So, again, this many of, have, of us have rashes, but are they itchy and are they located around your feet, your buttocks, or waist? That was true for me. I had them around my waist area. In fact, of all of these, that's the only symptom I actually had. But And I did test positive for strongyloides sericalis. So that's number one. Number two, do you have upper abdominal pain and burning? All right, I didn't, but this is one of the symptoms. So you go down this checklist and see how many of them you have. Do you have diarrhea or alternating diarrhea or constipation? All right, that's number three. Uh, do you have a cough, a persistent cough? Number four. You have red hives near the anus. Number five, any vomiting. Number six, have you had weight loss since the beginning of your infection? Now, many people experience weight loss once they start the Mergallin's diet, but this would be from the beginning of your infection. Did you have weight loss? Those are what are recognized as the seven symptoms. Now, if you have the seven symptoms, you know, I'm not diagnosing you, but this is where you run like hell to your doctor and get a blood test. Uh, that, and and it, I think Quest Diagnostics will, will do the test for you, and you can, you can see. And, and well, your doctor's probably not going to believe you because uh, strongyloides is, is not characteristic to the states, to the United States. It's, uh, it comes from excrement, generally of an infected uh, animal, and it could be a bat, it could be birds, it could be uh, uh, even dogs, you know, any, any animal can contract it. It uh, has an interesting, it is recognized by the CDC, and it has an interesting life cycle starting, I believe, inside and then coming to the surface. It is contagious. Uh, it, you know, uh, skin contact. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you wore, if you change garments, that w if it would be contagious that way, but it definitely is contagious through skin contact. And is not, uh, it, now, the symptoms can be there for years. I mean, I mean uh, it can be dormant for years before these symptoms uh, come out. And if you look at some of our blog posts and you go back to uh, Mother's Day of last year, I did a, a blog post called Undressing More Gallons. And in that uh, blog post, I, rec I listed many, many of the cofactors. Now, there are many cofactors like strongyloides sericalis that can be dormant for years, even Lyme disease. And by the way, the only question here about Lyme disease that you, you might feel uh, that could be construed as part of Lyme disease is a joint swelling and pain. That doesn't necessarily say or identify, but it's a possibility. So we don't really have a set of questions that can say, yes, you've got Lyme disease, you need to do it. But we can refer to the Morgellons, the Charles Holman Association and some of the research that they published, and one of the uh, studies, a, a uh, study I think they did uh, either 10 or 12 more gallons patients that people who they claimed or determined had more gallons, and they found in 90% of those people they also had Lyme disease, and they specified there are two types of uh, spirochete that they identified, and 70% had one type, and 30%, I think, had the other type of spirochete, both of them known as Lyme disease. So let's not get our panties in an uproar because Lyme disease can be very, very serious. In fact, I almost died from it uh, back uh, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, it was so severe in my life, but along the way, uh, 
my protocol came to take form with the boosting of the glutathione and the uh, uh, garcillin product that we have, which is a natural antibiotic. <clears throat> we talked. I talked about it a week or two ago, <clears throat> two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, that seems to be very effective. Now, remember, I am allowed to uh, to direct you to supplements that boost health and immune functioning. So, by using the protocol that I've developed over time, it seems. To me, that Lyme disease isn't such a big, bad animal, and most people don't even know they have it, and maybe never even know you had it uh, as you, you're on the protocol and get your life back. So in my book, it's called Lyme Disease Doesn't Have to Own You Anymore. It goes through all the standard techniques and dealing with Lyme disease. Most people go through Lyme literate medical doctors. Now, the doctors con uh, connected with the Charles Holman Association are Lyme literate medical doctors and do treat Morgellons as Lyme disease using very strong, sometimes uh, powerful antibiotics. And I have the personal experience of having gone through the protocol myself. And my opinion is the Garcillin is far more effective over the long haul, but that's my opinion. Now, do you have a sleepy partner, anyone with whom you've had close body contact? Huh? Has your sleeping partner become infected? All right, that's an important question, again, for research, because the Charles Holman Association and those connected with it claim that Morgellons and, uh, is not contagious, that you can't catch it from somebody else. Maybe an animal, they say, but not from humans. Well. Then again, the uh, the unfortunate part about uh, uh, Dr. Saverly's book, The Morgellons, The Legitimization of the Disease, is she only discusses uh, Morgellons. She only discusses filaments and fibers. She does not get into mites. She does not get into columbula, other than to notice that it's probably in your figment of your imagination that you might think you have columbula. And uh, But, you know, for the purpose of the book, it's to educate physicians, and I would think it would be silly of her, even if she knew about mites in Columbia, to bring all that in and muddy the water, because her goal is get the fam doctors familiar with it so they don't, uh, so they stop treating you as delusional, which would be very nice. It would be wonderful if a doctor simply said, you know, you've got something, I don't know what it is. It could be more gallons, but I don't know how to treat it. Rather than go to a psychiatrist, I think you've got a, you've got a, a, a mental problem. Well, the next thing here I'd like to know about is your eating habits. So I ask you about, have you had weight loss? All right, we did that one. When did you first notice your symptoms? Oh, we'll get to eating later. So this gives me a little bit about uh, uh, your history, how long you've been dealing with it, whether uh, you know, you're know you one of the lucky few that have had it only a couple of months and found me, or whether you're more unfortunate and have been suffering for 20 years, again, for the data uh, information. How were you infected? Briefly describe how it happened. Well, I'd say about 15%. Have no idea how it happened. Others can pinpoint it. They can pinpoint it to visiting somebody's house or, or being uh, uh, at Universal uh, it, and sitting on a toilet and getting up and feeling the itching happen uh, from then on. Or chopping down a tree or, you know, many can identify where it happened or after uh, going to a salon. So this, this is interesting, and it again for uh, information and for data uh, collection. What treatments are you presently using? Well, I'd like to know, uh, you know, what medications you're on. Not that I'm an expert in medications, but it, it helps me to uh, see uh, how uh, much your health has been compromised and how uh, what what's happening. Do you follow parasite message boards? Well, some people do, 
Very few do. And some say, hey, where do I find one? And the answer is, hey, stay away from them. They're the worst that you can, that you can ever expose yourself to. Uh, and if you ever find a parasite message board, uh, leave a message and send them to me. Are your skin reactions or limited to certain areas of your body? If so, please describe. So I want to know, well, uh, is it all over your body? Is it just limited to uh, your torso or your legs or your head or your scalp? Uh, then here I ask a question which I probably should take out. Do you know if you have more gallon, strong goloides or columbula? Uh, you know, some people pretty well know, others have no idea. It doesn't matter, but I guess for a data collection, it would be nice to go through that. What is your weight? So I'd like to know what your weight is at this point. How many pounds over or under are you? Uh, that, again, gives me an idea how you're going to you know, be doing, I mean, when you're on the more gallons diet, it's likely that you're going to drop pounds and you're going to want to uh, discover and incorporate means of getting your uh, certain food intake up to keep your weight up. Are you male or female? Okay, this is very important. Have you ever re received a diagnosis regarding parasites? I'd say probably only a very small percentage, 2 or 3%. Do you have any other diagnosis or medical problems? So again, this is background. <clears throat> Do you itch more or feel more biting when using a computer or are around EMF, uh, electromode, electromagnetic magnetic fields? Uh, this is important because if so, uh, it may be important part of the protocol to start reducing your exposure to microwaves to shield your uh, modems and and so on to uh, get rid of dirty electricity in your home uh, that can be an important part because this can be a significant cofactor and to avoid at all costs uh, going to 5g if you look at our blog post there have been many many updates about the dangers of 5g uh, from various experts around the world have you infected anyone else with parasites? If so, describe. Okay, here's another question earlier. I asked if uh, your sleeping mate has, uh, has been affected. And here again, we'll see that uh, if you've uh, affected anybody else, so your grandchildren or uh, relatives or friends or person you ride to work with in the car, do uh, you have a sleeping partner? Okay. Uh, now, please describe your eating habits. Now, this... This gives me a, a, a clue here. Uh, I get people who, hey, I'm, I'm uh, really eating well, you know, uh, and I'm, I eat healthy. I eat meats and vegetables, and I like a lot of fruit and things like that. Or I get people who I have a, a junk food uh, addict. I'm an adjunct, junky food guy. I eat candy, I eat garbage, you know, all that kind of thing. Well, now I'm looking for candida albicans possibilities. So people who are generally, okay, overweight, they're overweight, and they have uh, uh, less than desirable eating habits, boom, it's highly likely that you're dealing with candida albicans. Uh, there was also a question here, somehow I overlooked it, about digestive issues. Yeah, here it is. Oh. Do you have any intestinal or digestive problems? So I'm putting together this information. Yes, I got digestive problems, and they, they have this diet, and they're overweight. Boom, <laughs> candida albicans. I'm not a doctor, but go look it up. Read Chapter 4 of my book. There's about uh, 10 pages about candida albicans, and most likely that's an issue that you want to deal with. So in my recommendations, what am I going to do? Get rid of all grains, not only white, white, white rice, but all grains for a period of time. And I uh, suggest the, uh, the supplements uh, that uh, help build your mucosa, the L-glutamine, uh, is a natural sugar that helps uh, build the, the mucosa. We look at lefinuron, 
a pet med that we often talk about that helps uh, inhibit the production of chitin, which is a, a, the building block of uh, all kinds of fungal organisms. We let, look at the, the kinase enzymes that we have to break it down, and we look at the enzymes, the uh, uh, agro-relief enzymes to uh, take when you're consuming food to uh, start assimilating and get the gut working. Because, as Socrates says, I believe it was Socrates, all disease begins in the gut. And with our uh, wonderful, beautiful, fantastic Monsanto Corporation polluting us with GMOs and uh, glyphosate, Roundup, uh, the, you know, which is also patented as an antibiotic getting in our food supply, contributing to uh, destruction of our gut biome, some of us got some real serious problems. Not only that, many people have undergone, and there's a series of three updates in my blog about the dangers of antibiotics on a long-term basis uh, that can also uh, destroy your ability to uh, uh, assimilate food. So from this information, then I can tell you what is likely you are dealing with, and now that you've gone through it, uh, you now know exactly what you are most likely dealing with. Again, I am not diagnosing you. I am educating you. You can read the book. You can go to uh, uh, other uh, sources on the Internet to confirm that what I'm saying is right on. And then I provide you the detailed recommendations how to deal. Now, one thing I didn't even ask on the questionnaire do you have intestinal parasites? Why didn't I ask that question, Robin? I don't know. <laughs> well, the answer is, well, the answer, you got it. Everybody has them. And, you know, don't take it from me. Uh, you know, one of the blog posts uh, uh, is a, uh, a video, a YouTube video by Dr. David, uh, Davidson in uh, New Jersey here, and he and his uh, associate that did the, the video, 100%. You know, it's known that, classically known that, four out of five of us have intestinal parasites. He claims 100%, and I'm more inclined to agree with him. So in the protocol is also what to do for intestinal parasites. Now, I, I uh, counseled a lady the other day who was doing some other protocol, and uh, there was an intestinal cleanse. I recommend do not mix my stuff with anybody else, okay? I don't know what their stuff is or, or whether it feeds these organisms or not, but I asked her what was in the uh, cleansing protocol, black walnut. <laughs> it feeds columbola, and 90% of us have columbola or dealing with columbola, believe it or not. And mites, I don't know, probably feeds mites as well. So these people don't know. Your doctor doesn't know what to do. They say eat healthy, but they don't know what that means. You know, just eating, you know, but to them, eating healthy means eat your fruits, eat your grains, eat your... You know, as far as they're concerned, your your wheat grain that uh, that you get at the at uh, your food store uh, with Wonder Bread is sufficient. You know, or or the seven grain sprouted bread is healthy. Oh no way, that's not gonna cut it. Not here. 